LTI Mine Tree climbs more than 3% after the first quarter results beat expectations. Net profits rise 3% sequentially. Revenue too increases nearly 3% quarter on quarter. Asian pay in dips more than a percent and a half on the back of a week showing in the past quarter. The management says demand conditions for the paint industry were tough. Brokerage firms Jefferies, Philip, as well as CLSA also trim their earnings estimates. However, the stock has come off close on 4% from the low point of the day. Just Dial is the top gainer, 52% higher. In fact, 52 week high, 15% higher as the profit for the company grows nearly 70% year on year. In the first quarter, the margins too doubled to around 28.7%, led by improved cost control. Z Entertainment slips nearly 6% after the board approves its issuance of 10 year foreign currency convertible bonds worth around $239 million that are to be converted at 160 rupees per share. Nazara Tech also lower in today's trading session, down by almost 3% after the two subsidiaries of the company get a GST demand notice worth nearly 1120 crores. Hello and welcome to Chartbusters. I'm Nigel Souza. Joining me as always is Mangla Malu. Well, today it was uh, the perfect sense of this kind of bull market that we are in. The markets were down close to around 50, 60 points initially. That dip has got bought into and now we're up close to around 100 points from the low point of the day. The Nifty Bank, that's trying to find its form and that's higher in today's trading session, though the breadth of the market is still a little bit under pressure. Hey, Mangla. Yes, Nigel, you know, it's the breadth of the market, which is something that uh, we will keep an eye out on, though there has been marked support coming in from the FMCG pack as well over the last couple of trading sessions. Right now, as we speak as well, HUL has moved to the high point of trade. In fact, a near 3% recovery from the lows of today, taking the stock move to 10% for the month of July itself. So let's get in Apurva state of Samco Securities for a quick technical check on the market and the stocks that he's, uh, you know, tracking right now this morning. Apurva, what's your sense on the indices and the individual stocks? morning and thanks for having me on the show. So, uh, for, uh, talking about Nifty, if you look at the seasonality perspective, so one week before budget, Nifty has normally uh, traded with a negative bias. So, uh, right from 2010, if we see currently, uh, there were about 17 budgets, four, 14 were full budgets and three were interim. So, from these uh, uh, 17 uh, budget sessions, we have seen that the Nifty's uh, one week uh, prior uh, returns before the budget is uh, negative half a percent and one week forward returns after the budget is about 1.32 percent. So I believe that markets uh, would be trading with a slightly negative bias and crossing the 24,700 mark before the budget would be slightly difficult. Once the budget is out, we can uh, take a fresh look on the indices and then uh, take a uh, perspective uh, from the stocks side. Uh, we have uh, Suntech Realty, which is looking good on the charts. So the Suntech Realty was uh, trading around uh, uh, the resistance was uh, placed around uh, 500 and it had uh, broken out of this uh, resistance and from there on uh, it has retested it once and now it's moving higher. So uh, the target for uh, Suntech Realty would be 699 and uh, stop loss would be 600. Another stock is BPCL. Uh, the stop loss for BPCL would be 300 and a target would be 340. It has been trading in the range of 280 to 330 and looks like it is breaking out of this range and uh, could head higher. Okay, all right, Apurva, thanks a lot for joining. In fact, on Suntech, there was a big seller. Mr. Pabrai has been selling for the last few quarters. It appears almost all of that has been cleared out, and that could be explaining why the stock in the last uh, 10 days or so, it's rallied closer around 15%, a relative underperformer, but that's coming back into its own. And Apurva is quite positive on that stock as well. For the time being, we slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Mr. Bansal, who's the Chairman and Managing Director of the Development Engineers. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching us here on Chartbusters. Let's talk about the newly listed engineering company, D Development Engineers. Uh, because it's newly listed, uh, it had to report its fourth quarter numbers today, even as we're in the middle of uh, the second quarter of this financial year. These are, you know, a 47% jump in uh, the company's revenue as well as the EBITDA did extremely well. Net profit, of course, was lower on account of higher depreciation and finance costs as well. KL Bansal, who's the chairman and managing director of the company, joins us to discuss the numbers further. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bansal, for joining in. You know, first things first, we're in uh, the middle of the second quarter 
of this financial year, whereas we have the numbers for the fourth quarter, so they do appear a bit backdated. But, you know, from the numbers that you have reported for the entire year, this year, revenues just shy of that 800 crore mark with margins at around 13%. What's your target for FY25? And what is the kind of order book that you're sitting on currently? So as we have been telling, we are absolutely on track as far as our margins are concerned. And, uh, you know, the order book as on 31st of March was around 800 crore of rupees. And uh, as you know that we are, a lot of expansion is going on in our uh, plants. Uh, we expect to do quite well in the uh, in this quarter as well as in the forthcoming quarters. Okay, all right, Mr. Bansal. So you're on track with regard to the margins. Could you tell us what's the yeah. track like? You know, from uh, this number that you've delivered in the last year, what kind of a growth uh, can you deliver? You 790 crores with margins in the vicinity of around 13%. I recall when you joined us last, you told us that capacity is going up drastically. And you expect utilization levels as well to go there. And that's very well taken. But give us the growth guidance for this year. And margins from 13%, you wanted to go towards 20%. But in this year, what does it move to? It, it, sir, it shall be reasonably well. I can tell you that. It shall be reasonably well. Uh, you know, okay. you, we told you earlier also, we told you earlier also that, you know, a lot of capacity addition is there. We have the order. Okay, well, Mr. Bansal, Mr. Bansal, let's make it a little bit more simpler. Last year, you did close on 30%. Can, can you reasonably do as well as you did last year in terms of a revenue growth? Better than that. Better, Better than, than that. that. So more than 30% more than thirty percent revenue growth, we're holding you to that. What about the margin profile? From that 13%, where, where does it go to? Uh, the ultimate target is 20-22%, but in this year, it improves by 300, 400, 500 basis points. Should we work with the number of high teens? Should be, should be around that. Should be around that. Very well. All right, should be around high teens is what you are saying, sir, but we'll hold you on to that uh, number. More importantly, you know, uh, sorry, uh, uh, exports. If you could break up your order book for us, how much of that is domestic? How much of that is exports? And this year, what proportion of your numbers would come in from exports? Sir, historically, we have been doing more than 50% export. And this year also, you know, the numbers will be the same. As a matter of fact, uh, the export quantum can be around 60% in uh, this year. Okay, and what proportion of your order book is uh, currently from exports and how much of that is domestic? Sir, again, answer is the same. That, you know, historically, we have 50-50 on, but this year our expectation is that we shall be doing little better in exports. What is the margin differential between domestic and exports? Because if you're expecting more contribution from exports and looking at higher margins, then one would assume that margins on exports are better than domestic? Sir, our gross margins are practically, uh, practically remain the same, whether it is for the domestic orders or for the international markets. However, you know, to execute uh, the uh, export orders, we have to spend a little more on that, although the, you know, the net uh, contribution is more in case of export orders. So, you know, the net EBITDA levels and, you know, the PAT levels should remain almost the same as for the domestic uh, jobs. Okay, got it. All right, Mr. Bansal, could you tell us what is the cash conversion cycle for the company? Cash conversion cycle is around uh, four months. Four months, okay. And is there a risk? Because, you know, I'll, I'll tell you why I ask you this. Because in the export markets, there is some bit of a slowdown on a global scale. So for your company, you're sounding reasonably optimistic. But is there a risk that this four months gets uh, expanded a little bit? Because four months is not short as well. You're talking about absolutely, 120 days absolutely. for cash conversion. Sir, absolutely not. Because, you know, the customers we are dealing with are, you know, the top customers in the world. You know, they are among us working 500 companies. And we have never had any issue as far as, you know, the delaying payments are concerned from our export customers. You know, whatever is defined in terms of payment terms, we get our payments uh, according to that, maybe with 10, 15 days here and there, nothing more than that. All right, take that point. But, you know, uh, post your uh, IPO, you were looking to repay some of the debt as well. Now, these numbers are fourth quarter numbers, so we don't know, uh, you know, what exactly is your current debt on the books as of now. And how much have you repaid post the funds that came in from the IPO? And to that extent, what is the kind of finance cost that one should expect this year from you? 
Sir, we 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 have already paid off uh, the debts as per the objects of the offer, and our debt has gone down uh, by more than one seventy five crores. And uh, you know, we expect that you know the our finance cost should drop down drastically. At least it will be in the range of twenty crores of rupees minimum. I am saying. And what does the number stand at right now after paying one seventy five crores? Uh, around two hundred crores. Around two hundred crores, approximately. Okay, around 200 crores. So that explains the kind of uh, finance cost that you're targeting this year, close to around 20 crores yep. as well. Wish you good luck. Uh, these are fourth quarter numbers, so obviously we'll look forward to uh, you know chatting with you after you report your first quarter numbers and second quarter numbers as well. So that way we'll get a better sense into what you're, whether you are on track for the targets that you have for this year as well. That's about D development. Take a short break. Come back on the other side of this con uh, break. We'll have our exclusive conversation with the management of GMR Group, who joined us in our studios yesterday. Welcome back. Well, the management of GMR Group visited CNBC TV in studios over the midweek trading holiday to participate in the town hall with Jeffrey's global strategist, Chris Woods. Remember, Jeffrey's has included GMR Airports in its India long-only portfolio at the expense of uh, weight cuts in stocks like Axis, HDFC Bank, as well as ICICI Bank. Well, my colleague Vivek caught up with Mr. Chavla of GMR Group to learn about the road ahead for GMR Airports. Let's listen in to what he had to say. Well, in the aviation sector, or I would actually more be, be more specific in the airport sector, right. we are at a very sweet spot. Uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, there's been much better clarity on the regulations. You know, the interpretation of the concession agreement uh, was a major concern uh, in the earlier part of, uh, of uh, privatization of airports. But now, uh, both the regulator and the companies which are in this space uh, very well understand uh, what is uh, what is the whole dynamics and the understanding behind those uh, uh, provisions which are there. So <clears throat> the second part is, um, if you look at the per capita income of India, uh, it's around two and a half thousand dollars, and you correlate what happened uh, when Chinese per capita income of two and a half thousand dollars was. As the per capita income increases, there is a dramatic shift that starts to happen from uh, railways or roadways into into the air into the air uh, uh, aviation. So, the uh, you know we expect as we go forward uh, a tremendous amount of uh, tailwind to come in the passenger growth. The key risk in this whole scheme of things is uh, the supply chain issues on the supply of aircraft. So. Yeah. You know, you see, uh, 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 you know, people struggling to get the aircrafts, and uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, India is such a large market now. Uh, there'll be a lot of focus of uh, both aircraft manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing, to supply into this market. It is the third largest uh, country in, in this particular space after China and uh, and U.S. So, uh, so we are quite well positioned. I think uh, it's a it's a decadal story now. Uh, and uh, all that we need to do is uh, don't disturb uh, with, uh, with tweaking in regulations, uh, bring more clarity, and there'll be more capital flow and more passenger growth uh, in this particular sector. So your two key asks are, number one, stability as far as policy is concerned, and number two, you know, one question that you asked, Chris, was a deepening as far as the bond market was concerned, especially for infrastructure. Could you explain the rationale behind, number one, why do you expect that? And number two, how will a player like you benefit from the most likely lower financing costs? Does that make you a little bit more aggressive in terms of uh, getting newer airports onto your roster or your portfolio? You see, we uh, our concessions are usually 60-year concessions. So you know, you're planning your finances depending upon uh, the whole concession period rather than five years. So when I talked about deepening of the of the of the debt capital markets is. How can we, uh, you know, take the dated bonds to 10 years, to 15 years, to 30 years? If you look at U.S., U.S. 30-year bond market is, is pretty deep, and hence they can really finance their uh, their infrastructure investments over there. In India, we are far too focused on the equity markets, and we just forget that uh, much bigger than the equity markets are actually debt capital markets, and 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 that is where I think the government should uh, focus more. I think Utpal's. Uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 <clears throat> briefing on on things coming together now, finally. Hopefully, I think that will get reflected in the budget also. Uh, previously, we used to uh, tap into the dollar bond markets. Of course, last one, one and a half years, uh, dollar bond markets are not competitive with the rupee bond markets. But again, here we are still pretty much restricted to between five to 10 years. We want to take it to 20, 25, 30 years. That's where it is important that pension funds, infrastructure funds, Insurance companies play a much bigger role. It's not a mutual fund market, but it's a, it's a very long uh, uh, investor market in that sense. Well, thank you so much for bringing up that important point. Last question from you. Uh, India has spoken about increasing the number of airports quite dramatically over the next few years. How will a player like you participate in this particular growing opportunity? And not only in India, you also have and you operate airports abroad. So how do you see the dynamics change both in India as well as abroad? And how will GMR airports and investors benefit from that particular journey? So honestly, in our business model, uh, you know, new airports coming into a fold are very opportunistic. Uh, uh, we are already more than 100 million capacity uh, uh, and, and, and traffic through our airports. And this is growing between 10 to 15 percent every year. So I mean, 15 million passengers growth organically uh, is is good enough. That means adding almost two medium-sized airports every year in our in our portfolio. But yes, uh, you know, uh, passenger experience, uh, working with airlines to uh, to make different hubs, uh, taking uh, passengers into the hinterland, connecting them globally. I think uh, with these privatizations, uh, it will be very helpful uh, in taking world into, into tier two, tier three cities and allowing, of course, tier two, tier three cities to, to fly into the global world. So, I mean, it's an important part of globalization. And uh, hopefully, I think uh, uh, last announcement of the government was that they're going to bring about 13 odd airports for privatization. I think now the elections are over. Hopefully, I think that will come sooner than later. So that will be very important uh, uh, for the whole sector. We will, of course, participate in it in a disciplined fashion. Right, interesting conversation out there with the management of GMR airports. A bit of uh, decline in the markets led by the Nifty Bank. The Nifty Bank was holding up one end of the market right now, but it's come off the highs and as a result of which the Nifty is just about dipped into the red and that's largely, uh, you know, the dip is contained because the IT stocks, they're doing well. So TCS, Infosys, all of them have seen a fresh spike. Infosys reports its numbers as well. We wrap up on this edition of Chartbusters, but as we do that, let's listen into an exclusive India is the best long-term equity market in the world. That's the word coming in from Jeffrey's Chris Wood, who visited the CNBC TV 18 studio for a town hall on the markets with some of the biggest market stalwarts in the audience, including the likes of Ramesh Damani, Utpal Shet, Ravi Dharamshi. In an hour-long session, Chris Wood gave his take on the performance, valuations and the outlook itself for the Indian market going ahead. Hear him out. India is the only stock market I'm aware of right now where, where the small mid-cap th sector is doing way better than big caps. Absolutely unique. And it's driven by this domestic phenomenon. This is not replicated in any other market right now. The best long-term equity market in the world. Clearly, the U.S. has done fantastically well. But in the emerging market Asian context, yeah, India to me remains the, the great domestic demand story. You have this very emerging uh, equity culture. But what, as you rightly have just highlighted, is amazing is the dynamism of the uh, local asset management industry and the growing retail participation. And actually everybody, I've been in uh, Mumbai two days, everybody in the from the financial industry, I think, is a staggered by the resilience of the market following the surprise election result. My understanding, obviously, the excess valuations in India, the perceived excess valuations of the small mid-cap area, but my understanding in recent quarters, they've had the best earnings growth too. So it's not completely divorced from underlying fundamentals. No, the only issue, the, the risk in India is simply that the, some of these stocks are very high uh, valuations, so there's a risk of earnings growth disappointments. Uh, the big point for your viewers to understand is the foreigners are remarkably underinvested in India. So we believe that the global emerging market funds, who are the prime investors in Indian equities, are barely neutral in India, partly because the neutral weighting of India has gone up because it's outperformed. 
and partly because they haven't really been able to get into the market because the local money has kept at evaluations where they're not comfortable with.